Hello, and welcome to the Chess Journal's Editor Highlights Podcast. Each month, Chess Editor-in-Chief Dr. Peter Mazzone highlights key articles from the current issue of the journal to help clinicians stay informed about new research in the fields of pulmonary, critical care, and sleep medicine. To introduce this month's episode, here is Dr. Peter Mazzone. Thank you for tuning in to the Editor's Highlight podcast for the October 2023 issue of the journal Chest. We have a great lineup of diverse content in this month's issue. Over the next 15 minutes, I'll provide a brief overview of key manuscripts published in each of our content areas. We'll start with our asthma content area. Bronchoscopy is not routinely recommended prior to initiation of biologic therapy for severe uncontrolled asthma with a T2 phenotype. In this issue, Cozio and colleagues report on a prospective cohort of consecutive severe uncontrolled asthma patients who underwent bronchoscopy, exploring the safety and usefulness of bronchoscopy in phenotyping and endotyping asthma prior to the initiation of biologic therapy. Of the 100 patients recruited, Signs of gastroesophageal reflux were detected in 21, vocal cord dysfunction in 5, and tracheal abnormalities in 3. Culture isolated bacteria in 27 and fungi in 14. Those with infection were less likely to have submucosal eosinophilia. Eosinophils were detected in 91% of bronchial biopsies, generally correlating with blood eosinophils, but discordant in eight patients. These findings suggest that routine bronchoscopy in patients with severe uncontrolled asthma who are eligible for biologic therapy is safe and may help to phenotype and personalize asthma management. Next is our chest infections content area. In the era of novel therapies for cystic fibrosis, it is unclear if traditional treatments can be withdrawn. In this issue, Cadidis and colleagues report findings from a retrospective analysis of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Registry designed to determine if in the era before CF modulator therapy, people with CF who received Dornase Alpha and hypertonic saline have better preserved lung function than those treated with Dornase Alpha alone. 1,241 patients with cystic fibrosis were included, 619 of whom received Dornase Alpha only, and 622 who were treated with both Dornase Alpha and hypertonic saline for one to five years. After accounting for variables to address confounding by indication, Patients treated with Dornase Alpha and hypertonic saline had similar FEV1% predicted to those treated with Dornase Alpha only. These results suggest that prior to the use of CF modulator therapy, adding hypertonic saline to Dornase Alpha does not impact lung function in patients with cystic fibrosis. Also in this section, is an original research article that shares results of an open-label trial of amikacin liposome inhalation suspension in mycobacterium abscessus lung disease, and a research letter that explores the effectiveness of beb against hospitalization and death from the Omicron BA4, BA5, and BQ1, BQ11 COVID-19 subvariants. On to our COPD content area. Inhaled corticosteroids may increase the risk of pneumonia in patients with COPD and are commonly used in patients with COPD bronchiectasis overlap. In this issue, Ritchie and colleagues report findings of a nested case control study obtained from a cohort identified through electronic health records designed to determine if the use of inhaled corticosteroids in patients with COPD bronchiectasis overlap heightens the risk of hospitalization for pneumonia. 
Over 360,000 patients were eligible for the COPD cohort. The presence of bronchiectasis in this cohort increased the risk of pneumonia. In the nested case control populations, inhaled corticosteroid use increased the odds of pneumonia in those with COPD if used in the past 180 days, but did not further augment the already elevated pneumonia risk in those who also had bronchiectasis. In those with COPD bronchiectasis overlap, treated with inhaled corticosteroids, a lower blood eosinophil count was associated with pneumonia. These findings suggest inhaled corticosteroid use does not augment the already increased risk of hospitalization for pneumonia associated with concomitant bronchiectasis and COPD. Next is our critical care content area. It remains unclear whether intubation should be initiated early in the clinical course of critically ill patients. In this issue, Wainis and colleagues used data from the Medical Information Mart for Intensive Care 4 database to emulate three target trials designed to determine if treatment strategies that intubate patients early in the critical care admission improve 30-day survival compared to strategies that delay intubation. 30-day mortality was higher with early intubation when strict treatment strategies with broad eligibility criteria were used, whereas mortality was not different when less strict treatment strategies and narrower eligibility criteria were used. Delaying intubation avoided intubation in most patients. These results suggest that treatment strategies and eligibility influence the impact of early versus delayed intubation, with equal mortality outcomes noted for strategies that are felt to be more realistic. Completing this section are two meta-analyses. The first, a systematic review with meta-analysis and trial sequential analysis of lower versus higher fluid volumes in adult patients with sepsis. And the second, a systematic review and network meta-analysis of non-invasive oxygenation strategies in adult patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. On to our diffuse lung disease content area. The association between lifestyle and the risk of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and the extent to which genetic susceptibility modifies the effect of lifestyle on IPF are unclear. In this issue, Ma and colleagues developed a lifestyle score and a polygenic risk score for 407,615 participants from the UK Biobank study to determine if there is a joint effect or interaction of lifestyle and genetic susceptibility on the risk of developing IPF. Compared to a favorable lifestyle, both intermediate and unfavorable lifestyles were significantly associated with an increased risk of IPF. Participants with unfavorable lifestyle and high genetic risk had the highest risk of IPF. Approximately one-third of the risk of developing IPF was attributed to the interaction of an unfavorable lifestyle and high genetic risk. These results confirm that exposure to unfavorable lifestyle increases the risk of IPF, particularly in those with high genetic risk. Completing this section is an analysis of the United Network for Organ Sharing Registry that describes national trends, risk factors, and outcomes of acute in-hospital stroke after lung transplantation in the United States. On to our education and clinical practice content area. Despite an increase in the use of simulation-based training to teach flexible bronchoscopy skills to novice trainees, the effectiveness of this approach and key instructional features remain unknown. In this issue, Gerritsen and colleagues present a systematic review 
designed to determine the effectiveness of simulation-based flexible bronchoscopy training and to identify the key instructional features. 11 of 14 studies identified reported positive effects of simulation-based training for flexible bronchoscopy, though a moderate or high risk of bias was noted in eight of the studies. Instructional features and outcome measures varied highly across studies. In the studies with the highest methodological quality and most relevant outcome measures, curriculum integration and a range in task difficulty were included components of the training. Though showing favorable results, this systematic review highlighted heterogeneity of training features and sparse evidence of training effectiveness on validated behavioral outcome measures in a patient setting as limitations of current knowledge. Completing this section is a chest review on climate change for the pulmonologist. Our pulmonary vascular content area is next. It is unknown whether pulmonary rehabilitation can improve outcomes following pulmonary embolism. In this issue, Gervan and colleagues report results of a randomized controlled trial of patients with persistent dyspnea following pulmonary embolism, diagnosed at least six months prior, to determine if an exercise-based rehabilitation program improves exercise capacity. 108 of 211 subjects were randomized to two weekly sessions of physical exercise for eight weeks and one educational session. Participants in the rehabilitation group performed better on the incremental shuttle walk test and had better scores on the pulmonary embolism quality of life questionnaire. There were no differences in generic quality of life, dyspnea scores, or the endurance shuttle walk test. These findings suggest that exercise-based rehabilitation improves exercise capacity in patients with persistent dyspnea following pulmonary embolism. Completing this section is a chest review on lung transplantation for individuals with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Our sleep medicine content area is next. Glycemic variability is associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease in patients with type 2 diabetes. The effect of positive airway pressure therapy for obstructive sleep apnea on glycemic variability is not known. In this issue, Aurora and colleagues report findings from a randomized controlled trial of 184 patients with type 2 diabetes and moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea designed to determine if positive airway pressure therapy for obstructive sleep apnea improves glycemic variability in patients with type 2 diabetes. They found that there were no differences in glycemic variability and glucose control measures between those who did and did not receive three months of positive airway pressure therapy. In exploratory analyses, glucose variability was improved in female patients receiving positive airway pressure therapy, and positive airway pressure therapy was associated with lower post-dinner and bedtime glucose levels. These results show no overall improvement in glycemic control or variability from using positive airway pressure therapy in patients with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea with type 2 diabetes. Completing this section is a large historical sleep clinic cohort study evaluating whether obstructive sleep apnea increases the risk of cancer. Next is our thoracic oncology content area. The diagnostic evaluation of individuals suspected of having lung cancer can be complex. Blood molecular biomarkers may assist with the evaluation. In this issue, Leal and colleagues evaluated the potential impact of a cell-free DNA fragmentation assay in the evaluation of individuals presenting with symptoms or imaging anomalies consistent with lung cancer. 
296 individuals, including 98 with lung cancer, who were referred for evaluation of imaging abnormalities and symptoms and had plasma samples obtained during a pre-diagnostic visit were included. Plasma samples were analyzed for genome-wide cell-free DNA fragmentation patterns. The median fragmentation score was higher for those with lung cancer than those without. A multivariate model predicting a diagnosis of lung cancer that included presenting symptoms, age, and smoking history had an area under the curve of 0.74. The addition of the fragmentation score to the model improved the area under the curve to 0.94. These results suggest that fragmentation patterns of cell-free DNA in the blood have the potential to aid in the diagnostic evaluation of individuals with symptoms or imaging findings suggestive of lung cancer. Also in this section is a systematic review, meta-analysis, and cost-utility analysis of observation, aspiration, or tube thoracostomy for primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Completing this section is a chest review that provides an update on biomarkers for the stratification of indeterminate pulmonary nodules. I encourage you to read our Humanities in Chest Medicine section, where you'll find a case-based discussion on addressing mental health needs among frontline healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, please review our case series publications for the month to provide novel and educational cases to help your clinical skills. I hope you enjoy reading all of the high quality content available in this month's issue of CHEST. As always, I'm grateful to the authors of this work, the reviewers who volunteered their time to improve the quality of these manuscripts and to our editorial board for guiding everything that we do. Until next month, I hope you enjoy the October issue. Thanks for listening to the CHESS Journal's Editor Highlights Podcast. You can find the articles mentioned in this podcast and more on chestjournal.org. And if you're looking for more context and commentary on articles in the current issue, please check out the original Chess Journal podcast, which features in-depth discussions with the authors themselves. We'll be back again with more Editor's Highlights next month.